Okay. I'll mute it so I don't get my echo. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Temple Tankard. I am Jim, aka Argent Wind, and I am the host today for DM and D Chat here on the House of Gamers Discord server and YouTube channel. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, the title of this: show, the care and feeding of players. We're going to talk a more, more player centric uh, episode today, uh, talking about. Um, the different types of players and the ways you can engage those types of players and then talking about some the concept of norms at your table and we'll get into what all that means here in a bit here but mostly obviously a role-playing game is not a game if you don't have players and you want to keep your players happy you want to keep your players engaged you want to make sure that the interactions between you and your players are are good ones um because it's all about having fun with your friends so first off, we're going to be talking about the types of players and ways that you can engage them a little bit more and ways, things to watch out for with those player types. And you're going to, if you go on YouTube, there's a, or on the internet there, there's a ton of breakdowns of different type player types, um, archetypes. There's t people like comparing alignments to players and all this other kind of thing like that. But my, one of my favorite sources comes from a very kind of unlikely place. Um, the types of players I, I like to kind of focus on came from the fourth edition D and D, probably the least favorite D and D uh, version out there for most players. But they had a breakdown of the player types there and how to and, and kind of descriptions and how to engage them. And so I'm going to use those today to talk about um, the kinds of players you're going to see. Uh, to be to be and so when I talk about these types of players. Understand, no one is one type and only one type. There are going to be a combination thereof. Some are going to be higher in certain areas and lower in certain areas. Um, and so those they're all going to be a mix of these types of players. And that can change over time. As you get into the character, as you get into the game, you may find yourself shifting from one type of player to another one, depending on how things are going. So um, keep that in mind as we go along here. Um, know that you can't really accommodate everyone and the dm's player type or their style is may not mesh exactly uh with um how the players mesh there but you'll kind of get together and and knowing these types knowing what the, where people's strengths are will really help you kind of lean on how to interact with them and how to make better uh encounters and more fun interactions throughout your game so to move on here, we have seven player types. We actually have an eighth one that I'll discuss at the end here, but the seven main ones. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the actor. The actor is the person who's going to be in character, who's going to be, who's going to know what their character thinks. They're going to be in that, in the moment there. They're oftentimes going to use a voice for their character. They'll refer to their character um, uh, in... Um, uh, they're always talking in character, always interacting with your NPCs and other players in character. And these guys can really be a fun addition to the player and kind of like bring people into the role play aspect because they're really into the role play. Um, the issue with the actor is that sometimes it can be a little overbearing. They can try to con command the scene and take over the role play. If everyone isn't all uh, a similar ve vein there, they may just dominate the session. And so you might need to kind of help coax other players and kind of help and maybe talk to that player to kind of tone it down a little bit, maybe. But eventually you kind of find a balance of what works. So the way to really encourage the actor, though, is to give them those opportunities, give them interactions with NPCs that they can really ham it up or get a chance to really talk down that talk, talk to that guard or uh, talk to that nobleman and get information from somebody or just ways they can kind of lean into their actor role. Um, so um, the next type is the explorer. These are the people that want to go everywhere and see everything. You give them a map, they're going to look at that map and find every cool little icon on that map there and figure out, we need to go here, we need to find out what this is, we need to go here, we need to find this. So they're the ones who are going to really delve into finding out all the things. 
um, especially when it's come to, to kind of that geographic. They want to see what's over that next mountain. They want to know what's in that town. They want to know what shop is across the street. Um, they're going to be into all the things they can find out about the world. Now, the explorer obviously is motivated by exploring, going out and checking things out, and having lots of opportunities to do that really motivates the explorer. However, the, the explorer can also be can also derail the game. They want to just pile on the side quest. They want to grab everything and do everything, and it's hard to rein them in sometimes. So you kind of have to find a balance with the explorer of giving them content to mess with, but not so much that it's overwhelming to the whole party and stagnates the whole game. So um, uh, the next type, the fighter. Um, and I don't mean just the fighter class, although the fighter class is probably one of the most stereotypical versions of the fighter. These are the people that live for combat. They want to crack skulls. They want to get in there and mix things up. They want to fight the monsters. They want to take down the dragon. Um, combat is what motivates them. And so having opportunities in, in most role-playing games, especially D&D as, 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 a, as a prime example, combat is very central to what goes on in the game. But there are times when you might kind of the fighter might get bored because there's too much talking going on or, or they may push an encounter to be a combat that maybe shouldn't have been a combat. So there's a little bit of kind of a, of, of a tricky balance with the fighter types to make sure they get that combat they want, but it isn't, it doesn't ruin the experience for everyone else. Sometimes that combat may not be the best way to go. So, um, the fighter can get you, get the player, get the party in trouble sometimes if they're just all gung ho, go, 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 kill the kill, kill, kill. So, um, keep that in mind there. If the fighter is pushing too hard, you may need to talk to them and say, Hey, I promise there will be combat. You got coming there. And so you kind of give him that little nod of like, now it's time. Whenever you bring up that initiative chart, tell us from the role for initiative that that fighter is going to be all in. So, um, keep that in mind with the fighter there. The next type is the instigator. Um, rogues are the classic instigators. Um, they want to, they want to, they want to mess with things. They're the little chaos goblins. They're the ones who are going to mouth off to the guard and get everyone in trouble. They're the ones who, who want to poke the bear, who want to do all the things that are going to make things exciting, but also can cause a lot of problems. They're the ones that want to push the shiny red button. Um, that means that the way to motivate an instigator is give them things to mess with. Um, they obviously are going to be into whatever they can do to, to throw things on their ear or mess with the party or mess with the NPCs or whatever they can do. So giving those opportunities is really going to draw that instigator into the game. The problem sometimes the instigator can get the party in trouble. Um, they can also be a little bit, if they want to push too much on the other players, it can cause some conflict uh, at the table. Um, they're always picking the player's pockets or they're just not trustworthy or they're well, sneaking off to go mess with things and making things difficult for the party, then there's going to be some, some discussions that may have to happen with someone who's too, too much of an instigator. So keep that in mind when you have those kind of players at the table. Um, the next type is the optimizer. And the optimizer is your min-maxer. They want to find the most optimal, efficient solution for things. They're going to have their player figured out. Um, they're going to have they're they're, they're going to have all their buttons uh, like on their character sheet all ready to go. They're going to know what all their abilities do. They know their character in and out. Um, and when it comes to the gameplay, again, they're going to find the best route to take to cover the best the 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 most the the most efficient route for the quests you want to do. Um, they're going to make all the they're going to be really into planning and figuring out the right way to deal with the situation. Um, and that, that, so giving the optimizer the opportunity to do those organizational aspects and basically get, give them a chance to encourage them to be uh, the organ, organization uh, obsessed people they are uh, is going to help really help them be motivated. But it can also bog down the game. If they're so focused on everything being a certain way, it can really slow down the interaction. It can also kind of ruin the spontaneity for other players. They want to just go and see what happens, but the optimizer has to have something something specific going on. So um, there may be a little bit of uh, kind of give and take with the optimizer and the other players. Um, but again, 
giving the opportunity, talking it over with them, or letting the players kind of work that out amongst themselves, the optimizer can be a really helpful person at the table. Sort of related to the optimizer, but in a different way, is the problem solver. They're the ones who love the puzzles. They want to figure things out. They want to. They want to. They, they want to get. They want to get into the nitty gritty of things. They're the, your rogues who love to figure out traps. Um, they're the ones who who want to figure out what makes this person tick, um, and how to how to get through a situation, maybe with or without combat. In combat, they're going to be the ones that's tricky with the, with the tricky tactics, or setting up the ambushes. The problem solver loves this kind of thing. So, giving the opportunity to really jump in and do that, where they can solve those problems, there is going to keep them motivated. Where they get a chance to shine with that, with their. Um, <laughs> Uh, with their uh, ability to figure things out. Um, but then again, too, the problem solver can also tend to dominate sometimes. When a puzzle does at the table, they don't want anyone else. I'm solving this. I'm working on this thing. I'm going to figure it out. And they can kind of shut everyone else out of, the, out of the table there. So a way to kind of tweak that a little bit is don't give the problem solver the entire thing. Give other pieces, parts of the puzzle to help them bring them into the solution. Um, don't if the problem solver is trying to find out something from from somebody trying to figure out what's going on, giving some information to other players who have applicable skills um, who are in the right place at the right time is going to bring them all into that problem solving in, into that into finding the solution for what's going on. So um, again, problem solver is going to be a big help, but you kind of get everyone else involved in the solution as much as possible as well. So that no one is feeling left out or just like, okay, I'll just sit back and watch this guy figure it all out for us. Cause it, it's not going to be fun for everybody. So a way to kind of bring everybody into it is going to be a lot of a big help with that situation. Um, and the last primary type of character I'm going to discuss is the storyteller. This is the person who knows the lore. They want to know all the background of things. They want to delve into what makes, where this faction came from. Um, they're going to know all, all about like like the history of the shopkeepers and what happened before. They're going to get into the story and the meat of things. They're going to know the plot. A lot of times your storyteller is the one keeping the best notes because they want to know, they want to draw those connections. They want to make those, um, those uh, plans for things and they want to see um, how this thing you're doing now connects back to something you did before. So storyteller is often going to be uh, the person who's going to engage with the lore more than the other players sometimes. Again, the storyteller can sometimes dominate that if they want to, like, well, where did this come from? Who was this person? Where, who was their parents? Um, and so they can kind of, and the, and, and the rest of the players are going, oh my God, we don't need to know all this information. But you might. So giving them that information, and it may be that you want to, with the storyteller, give them access to information outside of the game, saying, here's a primer. I'll tell you about that later on, or you'll find out more later. Encouraging them, encouraging their 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 desire for knowledge about things, and letting them be a big part of the story, but it won't bog down the rest of the players and bog down the action sometimes with things. Um, so uh, every one of these roles, every one of these character type player types, I mean, is going to have positives and negatives to them. And it's, and again, you're you're not all going to be one thing. You're going to be sort of like finding you're finding like you're like you're really high as an instigator, uh, but you don't really care about problem solving. Again, so knowing that about yourself and know, kind of rating yourself, maybe on a one to five scale in these different, seven different types, will kind of give you an idea of what you are as a player, what maybe motivates you as a player, where you might want to, like, maybe I can look into this a little bit more. Maybe I can kind of focus on this little aspect a little bit more to be a more rounded character, rounded person in, in, at the table. Or, as the DM, hey, this person's really into this. This person's pretty good with this. Let's put these two in a room together. Or let's put them in a situation and bring in somebody else where they can all kind of interact in a way. Um, so, again, having that information is really, really helpful when it comes to... Uh, we just have a little camera glitch here for a moment. Um, <laughs> okay, we're all good. Um, so uh, we're, we, really, we really have a, an opportunity to um, 
kind of know more about your players. And this is something maybe you do at a session zero. Have everyone, here's the seven types. Rate yourself one to five. Figure out where people rate themselves as fours and fives. Rate this as ones or twos. And it can really kind of let you balance uh, the types of encounters you're running with the types of players you have at the table. Okay. Um, I mentioned an eight type there, and that's the watcher, the spectator. Um, some people just want to be there as part of the experience. They don't want to engage as much, but they're going to be there because they enjoy what's going on. And we all take turns as a watcher or a spectator during games. If you're not part of the action, you're watching what's going on. Um, so that watcher type is something that uh, we all tend to file, fall into at some point or another during games. And being a good watcher is paying attention, knowing what's happening without interrupting or interjecting. Um, but then again, when it's your turn or when it's time for you to do something, to be able to step up and do things. Um, so uh, again, that watcher is that is that that eighth type that isn't really a player type, but more of a something that we all take turns at at some point or another. <laughs> uh, good to see you made it down. Awesome. Um, uh, and and as um, just to just to say this here, yes, um, I will agree, agree with Dragon there. The fourth the fourth Ed Demon GMG is actually has a lot of really good information in, into it. It's actually a great read if you want to get tips about running the games. The game itself may not have been everybody's cup of tea, but the DMG has some great advice in there, so um, definitely check it out. Um, yes, and, and exactly. Watchers aren't difficult. If someone's primarily a watcher, they're difficult to engage. Um, and so you just have to sort of like let them be the fly on the wall. Let them be a, a role that's not going to be vital. Having, a wa having the player who's a watcher be a bard, that's a problem. You might want to talk to that person, encourage them to be something that's a little less vocal to like interacting with people. Having them be playing like a a a, a silent rogue or monk character like to hang in the back and keep tabs on things. And that way you can be still part of it, or even a fighter who's gonna you know, move into combat when it's time. Um, but is doesn't want to interact with them a whole lot there. Having them basically take on like a bodyguard role. Uh, for another player is a great way for a watcher to be part of the game without being expected to say much or do much because they're there to be a watcher in character and out of character. So it's, 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 it may be you have to talk to that player about a better role for them or better character type for them or um, something else to, to be comfortable with the situation, but not a hindrance to what's going on. Because if you need to rely on them to do something and they don't want to do it, that's going to bog down the plot. So again, uh, a way to kind of engage that person without worrying about derailing something else down the road. So I mentioned doing this sort of thing as a session zero, uh, something, something in session zero, or something that maybe you're having trouble with um, uh, with keeping the players engaged or you're just having each other. So take a time, take a, take a either before a session or maybe after a session, say, Hey guys, why don't you go ahead and here's the, here's this, here's the, here's, here's these seven roles and uh, your brief description of them. Rate yourself one to five on these things and send it to me. And now you can kind of see like where they see themselves, maybe where you see them and then kind of figure out a way to work that in there. So, um, but that brings up another point. At some point during game, you might need to fine tune things. You might need to kind of revisit some things you did at session zero. Um, maybe something you didn't do at session zero, that you realize you kind of needed to. So don't be afraid to take some time uh, during a, a long running campaign, especially, or if you're on a break somewhere or other um, for, for uh, vacations or whatever else that to send out a message saying, Hey, let's talk about some things and just put it out there. Uh, one thing that's really helpful for your games I mentioned this at the start here is establishing norms. And those of you in the in the in the uh, uh, office culture world know that establishing norms is often what, what we do for meetings or work groups, where you decide here are the things we're going to agree to as part of this group, as part of this meeting, that we're going to all adhere to to make sure we have the best experience possible. It's the same for a D and D game. The norms help you establish. Kind of the, I wouldn't say rules of conduct, but sort of. I mean, it's the idea that we're going to agree to these things to help our experience be the best it can be. Um, 
And it may be the norms you establish initially, you might need to add to down the road or revisit them at some point and add something or change something, clarify something. It's, it's, it's sort of a living document that you can kind of do as you go on. And when something comes up that kind of goes against the norms, you can call it out and say, hey, we all agreed to this, this thing right here. Um, let's focus on that and let's kind of avoid this kind of thing in the future if we can. Um, and just kind of put it out that way, is it? And you want to make sure that when you establish norms that everyone does agree to it. If someone's like, I don't know about that, then then keep working with it until, you, until everyone gets full buy-in with them. Because if somebody doesn't want to adhere to it, or isn't going to want to follow it, it's going to cause problems down the road. So uh, norms should be fairly simple. Um, just pretty, just just something short here. Um, and something that everyone can kind of get into. And I did this recently with um, with my... Uh, I, I run for a group of teenagers on, on Sundays, uh, my, my, my kiddo and, and, their, uh, and three of their friends. Uh, and they're all pretty much first-time role players. They hadn't been had any experience there. They're all uh, anywhere from uh, 13 to 16 um, in, the, in, the, in the group here. And so one of the things we did in our session zero was establish our norms. And we talked about them and saying, let's kind of get, let's delve into what's going to help us do the best we can at our table. And we actually came up with four. And I had them written down. And every week I post them up on the board. Um, and I'm going to go over them here to kind of see what, what we came up with there. And understand, yours may be different at your table. You may want to take some of these here. Th these here. But first one was distraction-free zone. We want to make sure that everyone is present and engaged as much as possible. Um, and even when their character isn't involved, they're still paying attention and trying to be free from its distractions. In an in-person game, we make sure that... Um, uh, that none of us have our cell phones at the table, so we're not like not playing around on our phone or else that. Um, we try to make sure that uh, if we need to take a break uh, for bathroom, we all do that um, there. Or if somebody does go, they just kind of like just just quietly get up and go and come back as quick as they can. So it, it, it's, it's as few as few distractions as possible, because it's it's very difficult to keep a game going when things are keep happening. Now, obviously, real life is a thing. We have pets bugging us. We have family members that need, need help with something. We've got maybe dinner time, depending on what happens there, or bathroom breaks need to happen. Um, so, I mean, obviously those things are going to happen, but as much as possible, we'll try to minimize those things because it, it really helps everyone uh, there. Um, in terms of, like, combat and what that looks like during play is if you're not part of a scene at least being aware of what's going on. Obviously, you can't use the knowledge because your character may not be part of the scene, but in your mind thinking, okay, what am I doing? What is my character doing while this is happening? I'm going to say I'm off doing it at the shop, or maybe I'm off drinking at the tavern, or maybe I'm just sleeping it back, back, back in my room. Whatever it is, you can kind of like think about that. So when the DM comes to you and says, hey, what have you been up to? Oh, you have something to say. Same kind of thing in combat. If it's not your turn in combat, at least knowing what's happening during combat, so when it comes around to your turn, you can just jump in and go. So it's it's really important that, that distraction, keep those distractions out of there and focus on what's happening so you can participate when it's your turn and not bog things down. Um, so distraction-free zone, our first norm. Second norm, teamwork first. We are a group of friends playing a game. So in terms of like in real life, we're a team. We're, we're working together to have fun playing a game. So um, uh, so in this case, um, uh, obviously in, in, a, in a campaign where you have a little more adversarial nature amongst the characters, you have alignment conflicts in there, that's all fine. But make sure that everyone's aware of this or if it comes up there that you deal with it in a way that's going to make sure that no one... There's no major conflict happens. We don't want there to actually be fighting at the table. We don't want people actually leaving the table hurt or angry because of something that had happened because the teamwork broke down. Um, so with that in mind, we talked about with, the, with, with my teens there, um, never be cruel or dismissive to a player. If somebody has, a, has, a, has an idea you think is not a great one, you suggest something else rather than being, that's not going to work or, oh, that's dumb. That's what's going to hurt someone's feelings. So in that teamwork aspect of like, let's remember that we're friends here. We're playing a game. Let's be, uh, keep that in mind that, and obviously you have players that, well, this is the way my character would be. Your actor sometimes, you're that, that toxic actor of like, this is what my character would do. 
Well, then again, maybe, but that's setting up a really difficult situation. So let's focus on that teamwork aspect and kind of remember that we're that we're all friends here. Um, third norm we we established there was communication is key. Obviously, you're talking during a game, but if there's a problem you have with a player or with a, something that's going on in the game there, tell your player in the use of the X card or whatever else that, or at least like if it's been happening or you're not having fun with something, talk to the DM. Um, as a player, DM, talk to your players. If something's not going well, that communication is super important. Um, provide that honest feedback, critis- constructive feedback, hopefully, uh, primarily. But the idea that you can have that communication aspect because it's going to improve every aspect of the game. If you're communicating, if you're working together, um, everyone's going to have a better experience overall. Um, and it leads, it prevents people from making mis- uh, mi- from misunderstandings, making assumptions about things that maybe that's not what the bits one meant. Um, so just trying to be open and understanding that communication is super vital to having a, the best experience you can when it comes to your role-playing games and, and your groups. And the last one, and this is one that surprised me because my, 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 my four teenagers, uh, two of them brought it up. Like they said it there, metagaming. And so we put it in as a norm that metagame to a minimum because we all recognize that metagame, avoiding metagaming is impossible. We are playing characters in a game. We are not our characters. We, see, we don't see through our characters' eyes and hear through their ears. So we're always going to have no information that our characters might not have. But being aware of that and making the conscious choice to not act on something that your character wouldn't know is what we mean by metagaming. And so when you minimize that, you everyone has a better experience in terms of like being in character of telling a story together because you don't have people that are saying, oh, well, obviously... I, I can see this guy's in trouble, even though I'm across town and not in the room with him. I'm going to rush to his aid. How do you know? Oh, uh, we're first level characters and we just en- ended up fighting this thing here. Uh, well, I know because I've played this game before that this guy's vulnerable to this kind of damage. So make sure you all do that kind of damage there. Does that make sense? Does that character know that? Maybe, maybe not. So the idea of, of using that character, no- using your personal knowledge to influence the game, your character really kind of takes everyone out of the experience. Another great example, um, I played in a uh, Ghost of Saltmarsh campaign with a bunch of friends of mine. Well, I own the Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh. Um, I've run it three times uh, in various campaigns in different ways. The player house my, in, my, in my current campaign is based off the house from there. So I know the house. So I know me, I know that there's some guys waiting in the waiting waiting in the basement to ambush. I know there's a trap on certain doors. I know a floor is going to collapse if you walk across it there. But the fact that I know that doesn't mean my character knows that. And so I've made choices, conscious choices, to not use that knowledge that I have. Because again, it's metagaming. So being aware of when you have that knowledge and making the conscious choice to not do this I did it just last week in a game I was playing where I'm playing a sorcerer who's mostly lightning based. We ran across trolls. I mean, I don't know what hurts these. I've never seen these things before. I don't know what they are. So I'm like, like I'm just firing my spells. I have the ability to make fire spells, but I'm a lightning based guy. So I use lightning on them. It hurt them, but they were regenerating. So again, then somebody else used fire. Well, hey, that fight that, that regenerating. So we, we kind of piece it together as characters, as as the as the the people on in the game figured something out together, rather than just going, "Oh yeah, we know that we know fire hurts them. Hit them with fire." Maybe we did. I didn't know that, but this person might have. So again, the idea that metagaming to a minimum is an agreement we can we can we can, we can make. And it's going to make our experience, hopefully, in most cases, better. So, and those are the four norms we came up with. Um, we haven't changed them much. We've clarified them a couple of times, um, or just kind of tweaked them a little bit here. Um, it's it's um, it's working. It's it's been working great. 
Um, and occasionally I just have to say um, distractions or uh, don't teamwork guys remember that like okay and so and they're like, oh yeah okay and so they kind of right back to it so yeah, it, it, it's not going to work with every group it's not going to work at every table but um as dragon says here cell, no cell phones a difficult rule to enforce with adults it is um but it, it's one of those things of if it's a problem um and again this is my first time players they're teenagers they don't i just said hey don't bring them over here leave them at the table and it was fine um but it comes it Obviously, it comes down when you're playing online. You can't, like, monitor what people are doing. Uh, but it's one of those things where if someone's constantly, like, not paying attention or not focusing on what's going on there or or they're having the conversation of just, like, hey, could you focus a little more when you can or just, let, like, let's, let's not use that as a... I mean, obviously, you're t- dealing with... Di- your, your interaction with people are going to be different from one per- one group to another, one person to another. But at least saying, if you agree to it ahead of time, saying, hey, let's not, let's focus on, let's let's keep those distractions to a minimum if we can. That's one thing we can at least say, hey, we agreed to this. <laughs> but obviously, if they didn't agree to it in the first place, then there's not much, not much there. So as long as you're able to deal with it, as long as it's working out for you, I wouldn't worry. I, I'd say we're all good. Um, so, talking all about our players, about our interactions there, um, really it comes down to focusing on the, 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 the thing I keep, I, I keep trying to hammer home. We're all friends. We're all playing a game. We're all having fun. That's the, that's the we need to focus on. Um, so, hopefully, that's what's going on at your table. And if not, then hopefully some of the, maybe some of these little tips here or um, things can help uh, that at least in a little bit, at least in a little bit. So um, if anyone has questions out there or any uh, comments to want to throw in there, feel free to drop them in, obviously, in chat. Um, I have a couple more things to discuss here, but don't forget the uh, chat is available for us to throw some things out to each other here. Um, as, as Zach says, their feedback is a gift. Um, feedback both um, to your players and for your players to you. Uh, so knowing what's working, what's not working, is a, is, a, is a really important tool to keeping a campaign going, to have, long, to have longevity, uh, and to really go in a direction you all in, are enjoying. So feedback is essential to that. And so don't be afraid to ask for it. Players, don't be afraid to provide it. Um, but again, keep it constructive, keep it helpful. Um, and sometimes you may not hear things you may not want to hear, but at the same time, it's still going to be good feedback. If it's something actionable, something you can do something about, that's really, really helpful. Um, okay, perfect question. Sorry, I'll have heard it's off here. Which player type do you find the hardest to deal with when it goes off the rails? Uh, and then part two, when, when, which do you find the hardest to keep entertained? Both excellent questions here. Uh, in my experience, I would say the hardest to deal with when it goes off the rails is usually the instigator. They're the ones that are just like they're pushing the people off the cliff. You never can, you can never tell what's going to happen with them. Um, and sometimes they take their instigator, their role a little bit too much, where they basically just do things you know are going to they know are going to cause problems, but they want some people want to see the world burn. So it's 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 it, it can be hard to deal with. But one thing I kind of find with those players, when you have them in your group there, and you know that character, especially once you've been playing for a little while, you can kind of expect the unexpected. You know they're going to do something, and you can either plan for it or just, like, take it in stride and let it happen. Um, You never know what's going to happen with these guys, so feel free to let things go crazy sometimes. Sometimes they do something that's just off-the-rails bonkers, and you go to someplace fun with it. Um, so it can be difficult that way. Um, I find sometimes the optimizers are hard to deal with as well. Um, because again, they can just sort of like be so focused on the best, most optimal route. Uh, and their characters tend to be very overpowered um, because they're so min maxed and just going crazy there. Sometimes it, it can be difficult to kind of keep to, they can kind of just totally mess up an encounter entirely because wow, I didn't think of that, and holy crap, they they just took that thing out. Or, um, But then again, too, knowing that player, knowing that person, and what they're kind of capable of, you can plan for that. 
you can say, oh, yes, this is likely going to happen. Here's a way to maybe counter that or a way that obviously you, need, you don't want to take everything to say, I'm going to counteract this, 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 whatever this person does. But at the same time, higher level encounters are going to have more things to deal with. Um, fighting other parties of, of adventurers when you're higher level, they're going to have those optimizers too. They're going to have those people that are, that are going to hard counter some things from your group. So it's kind of a, a fun little way to go here where you start having a, what our big fight we just had was mostly, it's kind of like against two adventuring parties. Literally, it was like, so they had abilities that countered those, the players had kind of abilities that countered some of theirs. And so it was this interesting push and pull of abilities to see how things went there. So, um, yeah, the instigator and optimizer are kind of the like two different sides of the of the coin uh, that can be hard to deal with there. Keeping entertained, um, I mean, obviously the watcher, <laughs> uh, but the watcher tends to just not. They they're 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 there to have fun. Um, but you know, I think keeping entertained sometimes the explorer. Uh, you're constantly having to feed them new information, constantly having to feed them new stuff. Um, and if, if you're stuck in a place or they're you're you're not finding you're not giving them new content all the time to kind of sink their teeth into they can be sometimes they can sometimes get bored and um just sort of check out the game sometimes because the explorer like, oh yeah we've been here for a while i want to go someplace else i want to deal with some other people um but the player the party is trying to get this information or they're probably or, or in this one one location trying to do stuff so the explorer can be tough to keep entertained sometimes um i'd be kind of here from you guys too, like the what was some of yours uh, that you have experience there. I know, um, yeah. Dragon mentioned the watchers being tough to tough to, tough to engage. Um, so yeah, uh, other questions we might have. Um, I do find um, talking about so um i mentioned other places to find these player types here you, you can literally find almost every uh dm show dm tip show there at some point we'll have some version of this with different player types there and they're going to have different different uh, takes on things some different different experiences uh so if you are having difficulty with certain players i encourage you to go out and go out there and check some of those out um, because they're going to have some other good, good information for you. I've heard a number of people, um, I know Matt Coville, Matt Mercer, we talked about different types of players and how to keep them engaged sometimes. Uh, so, um, uh, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a, so yeah, definitely get out there and try some different things. Um, so Zach, I find it tough not to engage watching because I want to include them, but it feels like pulling teeth. It, it is, yeah. Um, you the, Like, you're kind of like, trying to draw something out of them and so sometimes you kind of just have to let them watch and check in with them see if they're still having fun and they're gonna pro they're probably gonna say oh yeah yeah i'm having fun this is really cool but they're just not doing anything so again you may just find yourself having to just say okay just watch jump in where you where you feel necessary i'm not going to latch on to you with any sort of major plot hooks or anything else um because you're, you're, you're not going to engage with it but at the same time, if they're having fun and they're part of the story because they're part of the group, uh, that can still work. Um, it's a, it, can, it can, but yeah, it can be. It can definitely feel like pulling teeth sometimes when you're trying to coax them into something and they just won't bite. Um, fighters are easiest, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah. If you if you have a combat heavy game, fighters are in. They're not a problem. Uh, the problem you might have is in, in a game that has a lot of like political intrigue or a lot of like investigation. That's where fighters really might check out or get bored, or they might decide, "Hey, enough with this stuff. I'm going to go in. I'm going to kick the door in and attack something." So, um, so yeah, it's it's um, it can be. It can make a game a little one sided if you're always having to, to appease the fighter. But at the same time, you're right. They're not hard to to engage uh, if, if you give them the opportunity. It's just finding that balance of combat versus not combat. Um, a great dungeon crawl comes along there, and the fighters in their element, and they're just like like uh, killing killing things nonstop. <laughs> Get them into a big battle or a war scenario for a couple of sessions, they're just in heaven. Um, so yeah, it's not hard really there, but yeah. Um, 
back in there. It is pulling teeth. You try and try and try. The well is dry. Um, yeah, it, 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 it is important to throw them a bone and see if they latch onto anything. They may surprise you. Um, you might have a player who's a watcher and all of a sudden they just bite on something. So them being part of it and then occasionally throwing something out there, not expecting them to do to, to, to do anything, but it's a great, great kind of pleasant experience when they do. So yeah, you, you want to keep it's like fishing. You're going to keep casting your line. Eventually, you're going to catch something. Um, or eventually, you're just going to go, go for those easier waters where there's more, where there's more fish. So, fishing metaphors. Yay. Um, yes. Um, personally, distraction is the worst issue. Uh, any people can suffer from it because it often leads many, uh, lead to many other issues. Exactly. If, if people are distracted, if people are having side conversations, or if they're not engaged in some way it's really difficult because um it can, it, the other issue you can run into is yeah they're talking over top of something else they're interrupting um they're it it, it can be it can lead to some problems so um distractions is can, can be a difficult time and so when you can have those conversations and maybe rein in some distractions there or just say hey can we just not or or another way i know for distractions is I, and and this has happened with our games and stuff there too. Is giving people time to visit before a game. And 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 one thing I do with my teens is I I make sure that we have a good fifteen twenty minutes, and I tell them, hey, we're going to start in fifteen minutes. We're going to start and then and give them like a five minute count. Hey, we're going to start in five minutes. Uh, start wrapping things up. Make sure you go, go, go get a drink. Go use the restroom. Whatever you need to do here, we're going to start in five minutes. And then hey, let's count us in here. Let's come onto the table and and sit down to play. Same thing with the players of the online session that we where you can do a situation where you say, "Hey, we're starting here. Um, let's wrap it up." So, um, and then hopefully during the game they've gotten some of that out of their system and everything else. But it doesn't always happen. Um, but yeah, it can definitely lead to other issues if you if you if you don't discuss it at least or or at least uh, see where you can kind of bring it in a little bit. Um, Oh wow, the hobbits from Lord of the Rings were players. What'd you classify each hobbit as? Whoa. Um, let's see. That's a tough one. Uh, I mean, you got your. I mean, Sam's kind of a problem solver. He's very practical. He's gonna have all this stuff. Um, he's gonna have. Uh, he has all the stuff and the extra food and everything else. He's gonna plan for food and take care of people. But then you see Sam as a, as a problem solver. Um. God, Mary and Pippin are kind of the two sides of the same coin, really. Um, yes, they're sort of explore, explorers, instigators. Uh, they, they they seem to be happy to be out doing stuff there, but they're always kind of getting into trouble and messing around with things they shouldn't be or um, speaking up when they shouldn't sometimes. So I can see the explore, explorer, instigator happening with those guys there. And Frodo, oh boy. Um, mm, he's a tough one. Uh, Frodo's, in a way, almost I kind of see, I see Frodo as a watcher. He just sort of along for the ride, and just like that, and like okay, well, we're just doing this. Um, kind of re the reluctant hero being dragged on in the situation, and not really wanting to be there in the first place, but obligated to do it after because everyone else is. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a tough one, I think. Um, yeah, Frodo is definitely the hard one. Um, uh, let's see. How much do you think your personal player type... Of, oh, great. Great question there. Your personal player type will have a, a lot of effect on your GM style. Uh, and so one of the, I encourage you guys to kind of figure out where you are on those scales. Um, I kind of see myself... I see myself more now in the kind of the actor, optimizer, storyteller. I, 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 I'm not going to say I'm not any of these things. I'm probably lowest in... Mm, I, I'm, and you may disagree with me on this, but I kind of see myself as a least of the, the, the is instigator. I, I don't like to just, I mean, in general, I, I, I want to make things happen, but I definitely see myself not overly instigating. Um, I mean, I will, I will kind of kick, kick the tires when I need to, or kind of nudge things along when I feel like, feel like I need to. Uh, but as a player, I tend to be a little less, um, of an instigator of all the all there, um, uh, optimizer survivability. Yeah, I didn't. I 
<laughs> uh, I definitely, yeah, I don't push all the buttons. I know that's going to cause a problem. So I'm like, no, just don't do that. I'm like, like, like trying to hold the optimizer, the, the, the instigator back, like, no. Um, so I think that's a, that's a fair assumption there. I said, so, um, yeah, I think, I think we have a couple different things there and uh, a couple different ways to get to go there. Um, so all con and wisdom. So you're all con and wisdom as a rogue. <laughs> okay, Frodo. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you just, you, you don't find yourself. Uh, so a lot of times with the, the situations there, they don't build, and, and that's a fun thing there. So you're, people who aren't optimizers are going to have non-optimal builds. And they may do some things that kind of like actually don't work for a character, but they make some interesting choices. And it's going to drive the optimizer nuts. <laughs> because what do you mean you only have a plus two in your best stat, in the stat you need for your class? Or whatever whatever version of, of that you're going to have there. So um, definitely uh, an, an odd mix sometimes. And that can lead to some interesting interesting, interesting play at the game table. Uh, other questions we got here. There's some out there. Okay. Your personal player profile affects how much you enjoy having players at your table who are a different personality type. That's a good question. Um, so, can we re- re- rephrase that there? Your personal player style, your personal like personal uh, um, player types, um, they can have, they definitely have some some difficulty with players of different personnel different different player types but again i think that's it's something that over time as a dm you're going to start figuring these things out yes you have your style but you see again the positives and negatives of, of, of every role and seeing that happen seeing that develop and then seeing what you can do with that um is kind of something you learn as you go along with dming seeing how did that actor, while they want to cheat, ham it up and steal the scene, but they're going to engage. They're going to be a part of something. And so when you can kind of let that person draw other people into it there, that's where you can kind of like, hey, rather than just talking with NBC, talk to other players a little bit. Do that with the other players and kind of and set up those situations where you can do all that. So where I might, I mean, I'm not an instigator, but I can definitely appreciate those instigators when they do things because they're going to make things happen. So it can definitely, it wouldn't say it affects my enjoyment, but it does change my planning. It does change how I, how I view the campaign and my encounters. Cause I know something's going to happen based on these guys. That optimizer is going to blow somebody out of the water with their incredible build. They've got that explorer is going to probably wander out of the room and, and try to like, find every little thing they can find. Um, and I, I just on Tuesday, we had an explorer type person who wandered way ahead and got themselves in trouble. And it just led to a really crazy messed up experience for all of us where we had to try to bring all that in. So um, I think it affects it, but it also lets you kind of figure out where you can draw on someone's strengths and lets you kind of develop yourself as a DM and maybe as a player as well, um, seeing how they're doing these things, kind of taking some of those examples and saying, hey, that's kind of fun. Maybe I'll try that next time I play. Or maybe I'll do something along those those lines or incorporate that sort of mentality in a character sometime or other. Because it's always fun to try something different. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's a good question, though. I mean, we definitely have difficulty especially for new dms uh, when you're first starting off when you have a very bias against a certain for a certain type of encounter a certain type of play type it makes it difficult to engage other people because you're not used to that it's not something you're comfortable with yourself so bringing that out of other players and, make, and presenting something that other players are going to like can be difficult so it's something to keep in mind that if you're having trouble with that look at these player types Look at some of these descriptions. Look at and maybe talk to those players of saying, "Hey, I'm having difficulty with this because I'm not really that kind of player." But what's going to help you and get that feedback? Again, that communication is key. 
Um, and so I'll just put this up here. Again, this is we put this up on the wall every time uh, we play. Um, I put this on the wall behind us there, our four norms. Uh, and it may be that, yeah, communication if someone's so, um, and that, that, that really, really does help. So, um, yeah. Any other questions here we got? <laughs> so, to kind of kind of sum it all sum it all up here. Um, again, don't be afraid to revisit that session zero. At some point, it's basically a long running game here. You might need to take that time to reestablish your norms, or maybe establish them if you didn't initially. Um, looking at those player types and kind of really taking stock of things, um, and maybe you do it as a group. Maybe you do it yourself every now and then. Just just stop and say, okay, what? How do I make this? Things are kind of stagnating. Things are not going the way I want to. I'm having trouble here. There's these player interactions that are, that are ca causing some problems here. Take a step back and reevaluate. Look at it. And again, remember you're you're all you're all there as friends playing a game, having fun. So that's how we want to approach it. What's going to make this the most fun? And if there's definitely some uh, some issues between certain players not working out very well. Maybe bring them together, talk it over, figure it out, and 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 or spend a little time and say, what could I do to help the situation um, as a DM, um, as players. So if you're when you when you are a player, keeping that in mind, seeing what you can do to help, seeing what you can do uh, to communicate, and not taking things in game as personally as maybe you might sometimes, or just kind of focusing on some some different way to do something. Um, that's always going to help with what you're with 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 making the game more fun for everybody. Okay. Well, I think we're going to call it there. Um, I want to thank you guys all for being here as usual. We're a little bit shorter shorter on time here, but uh, um, uh, I just I think uh, uh, we've you've got a lot to think about and a lot to kind of process here, and so uh, take some time. Spend some time with your spend some time with your players, kind of just chatting about the game. Um, and when you next time you start a campaign, there kind of focus on that session zero, thinking about some different ways uh, to do things. If you, if you enjoyed it, go ahead and hit that like for me. I'd love that. Uh, we always love to see those those there. Uh, if you have any ideas for any future shows, as always, throw some questions my way. Put a comment in the video. Uh, send me send me a, send me a, a message on Discord um, with the ideas or something you'd like to see. Uh, absolutely looking for uh, always looking for more uh, plans there. We are going every other week, so we'll be back in two weeks uh, for another show. Uh, and as always, if you want to check out Avarice, the Shattered World, we do play on t Saturdays every every week at two o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time, and uh, we are delving into uh, a, a new part of the campaign. And and uh, the players are I think, get themselves in some pretty big trouble if they're not careful. Pretty coming up here. So um, anyway. Thank you for being here as always. Thank you for, for commenting and question and, and, and chatting with us. Uh, I think your questions have been awesome. And um, as always, thanks for ha hanging out at the tavern. Next next time, drinks are on us. Take care. We'll see you again real soon. Bye.